Today, we are back at Classic Auto Mall to feature this absolutely gorgeous 1937 Packard 115C, the Packard for the common man. But before getting into all of it, I'm Jay. Welcome to what it's like. Picture this, you just obtained a classic car that you know nothing about, or perhaps you own these cars in the past and you're just here to reminisce. Either way, we feature the classics, vintage, some exotics, lots of orphan cars, and cars that are off the beaten path. If that sounds of interest to you, subscribe and hit the bell icon next to it to never miss a video. Before getting into this absolutely stunning Packard, it's worth mentioning that this Packard is for sale at Classic Auto Mall, which is located in Morgantown, Pennsylvania, which is the largest consignment car dealership in the northeastern part of the good US of A. With over 800 cars for sale when recording this episode, be sure to check them out, link in the description. Let's talk 1937 Packard model lineup. We're gonna start from the top of the heap and work down this time because this is the everyday Packard and it's at the bottom. So starting from the top, you have the 12, which also went by a twin six, which was available in three series. 1508, 1507, and 1506. Then there was the Super 8, which was also available in three series. 1502, 1501, 1500. Then you had the regular 8, which was broken down in a couple different ways. There was three series, CD and C series, as well as the 120-C series. It's also worth mentioning that Packard offered no less than 50 different models across all of the different lines. I know, Packard's way of doing things was super confusing. And then, at the entry level, there was the 6 Series, which more often referred to as the 115-C Series. This was the Packard for the commoner. Still has the look of an expensive, high-class car, but with an affordable price tag. Packard produced the 6 from 1913 to 1947. It's worth mentioning that the original Packard 6 was the top of the line, uber expensive Packard. It wasn't until 1937 that Packard could offer a car for the common man. It's worth mentioning that this wasn't their first attempt at making an affordable car for the masses. Packard introduced the Light 8 in 1932. You have to remember, this is the Great Depression. Nobody had any money to eat, let alone buy cars. And if Packard couldn't sell cars, they couldn't keep the lights on. For those that don't know, Packard was once thought to be the Rolls Royce of the United States. They made cars for head of states, but they needed to tap into a lower price market so they could sell cars that were more appealing to the general public. So in 1932, they launched the Light 8, which ultimately failed because it wasn't cheap enough and it only lasted one year. 1935, Packard tried again to make an affordable car for the common man with the 120 series. It was successful, but it was still too expensive for the common man. It was priced in the medium price field. It's worth mentioning they sold 25,000 units in the first year. Then the 115C came along in 1937. It was Packard's first six since 1927. 1937 is considered third generation of the Packard six, which had a production run from 1937 to 1947. The 115C could be had in seven body styles, sedan, wagon, touring sedan, touring coupe, sports coupe, business coupe. The 1937 Packard 115C competed with Oldsmobile L-Series and the DeSoto 6. Some highlights of this model include four-way hydraulic brakes, safety flex system, which was their independent front suspension. Let's talk specs. So I scoured the internet and this is all I could find. It rides a wheelbase of 115 inches. It weighs roughly 3,100 pounds, conflicting information on that one. The base price was $795, which is equivalent to you spending $17,044.57. Where do I sign up? Because I will totally pay that price for one right now. Anyway, total 1937 Packard production was 122,593 units, of which total 1937 115C was 30,050 units. Moving on to engines, only one engine on offer for the 115C. That was a 237 cubic inch displacement flathead six, 3.9 liters. It's good for 100 brake horsepower, 200 pound feet of torque with a bore of 3.4 inches and a stroke of 4.3 inches. 
which is mated to a three-speed synchro mesh floor-mounted transmission. Just wow. Standing next to this car. Ferraris, Porsche, Lamborghinis, they don't do anything for me. But this car, standing next to it, just check out the Swan. It's just a work of art. Everywhere you look, I absolutely love this. That's a Packard trademark there. Look at how these fenders are designed. Notice up here, there's a point, but it's not that big. It's very gradual. And then it gets more aggressive as it comes down to down here. It's very pointy down here. Whereas up here, it's more round. There is a point, don't get me wrong, but it's very, very subtle. And it just gets more and more aggressive as it comes back down here. Notice these windows, see how they're dished in? The drip rail, it actually doesn't have a drip rail, it's an edge. That's just an edge. Look at how all of this is just sculpted. Check out this rear fender. Now notice the rear fender. Back here, there is absolutely no point. But when you get to about here, there's a little bit of a crease. Point. And then it's pointed down here. This car is absolutely gorgeous. Coming back to the front real quick. I just want to show you all of this stuff that's going on over here. Just notice how this swoops down. It's so elegant. All of the lines on this car are just absolutely gorgeous. Just notice how these headlights sit up almost on a base kind of thing, but it's not like a flat base. They actually put thought into how they're going to mount this headlight. Coming to the door and getting inside, just look at how Art Deco this door handle looks. This door popped open at me. I just want to see if it does it again. Yeah, I didn't even push on it. Pops open. The door is extremely light. But I think that has to do with the way that it's hinged. Check out the way that this hinge system works. See how that slides into the body of the car? Also notice how the door is designed. It seems like it's tilted a little bit. Like notice how much more in the bottom is than this. Just check out the door panel and all the different materials used. Also check out how deep it is. Here's my fingers for reference. This looks like real wood, but it could be simulated. Door handle to get out, armrest, window crank for the big window. It's got a window crank for the vent windows. It operates like that. Just look at how massive that vent window is. That thing is huge. Absolutely massive. Coming down inside the pedal box down here, handbrake, clutch brake gas pedal just take a look at what this interior looks like so look you got rear storage space this looks like a jump seat but i don't think that you could use it it doesn't look like it would be very practical but just check out how that seat is designed I'm not getting back there. There isn't going to be enough space for me to go back there. But I never saw a chair designed like that, like a bench seat. It's a split bench seat. Also, notice how wide the running boards are to get inside of this car. I wear size I wear size 12 shoe. And it's up here it's, it's longer than my shoe is.
Oh, such a nice quality sounding shut. Check out the A pillar situation. Check out all of this. It's interesting. Here's what over the hood looks like. Over the hood looks like a million dollar view. And that's the best way I could describe it. If I was driving this car, I would feel like a million bucks. Here's what first person looks like over the hood. On to the button switches and knobs starting on the left and moving right directly in front of the driver is the speedometer has odometer inside of it as well as the bright light indicator to tell you if the bright lights are on. Headlights, ashtray, ignition just to the right at the bottom of the dash is the wipers. In the center there's a nice reading light with a hood, oil pressure, water temperature, fuel, amp meter, starter button, panel lights at the bottom, hand throttle, radio, and lighter. Just to the right, there is a key that is for the glove box lock and the clock is on the glove box door itself. Here's what under the steering wheel looks like. I wear size 34 pants. So if you're about my size, that is how much space you would have. It's the steering wheel moves freely. If you wore size 36, it might be a little bit snug in here. Up above, sun visor there, as well as nice oval sized uh, rear view mirror. There's a sun visor for the passenger. This is what I look like behind the wheel. There's tons of headroom in this car. As, as such, everybody wore hats back then and you could definitely wear a hat in this car. This car has a weird feel about it. It's small, it's very cozy inside, but it's a huge car. And uh, that's kind of what it feels like, but it feels so nice. It feels like I'm sitting in the nicest, comfortable, most comfortable chair that I've ever owned in like a pub style setting. It's just amazing. I love all of the, I don't know if it's real wood or if it's simulated wood, but it definitely feels nice in here. I love the steering wheel. Just check out how this steering wheel is designed. I love all the little nubs that it has, the banjo spoke, three spoke wheel. Just take a look around at all of the different things going on. There is a dome light up there. There is a light switch for it but there isn't a light switch for it over here. No, uh, there aren't any coat hooks. This is what visibility looks like out the back window. And I just love the fact that everything has this trim around it. I don't know if it's real. I don't know if it's simulated, but it's, it's a really nice touch. Like that window's got it. This window over here has it. The windshield has this wood as well as the driver's side. This interior is so nice. The windshield wipers are on the bottom instead of the top. Generally around this time period, they would be on top because the windshield cranks out, but I'm pretty sure that this one does not crank out. This one does have the cow air scoop, which is right here. And it operates like that. It's got three settings. That's the highest setting. That's medium. That's low. That's off. There's an ashtray there. On to the glove box test. Here's our test subject. Here's my hand for reference. Here is the glove box in question. Oh man, just look at that. Look, that is how big that glove box is. It fits in there long ways. And shuts. Coming back here to the trunk section. This trunk is extremely heavy. Look at how big this trunk section is. Spare tire, it's got a nice shelf, two, two tier. All right, so getting under the hood. Oh man, look at that. Notice the horns, look at how they are stacked on top of one another. Generator sits down inside there. There is the Packard plaque right on the firewall there. Real quick, wanna show you some other lines. Look at this line here. 
how it comes back it like tapers back into the body but it just has such an elegant look about it see how it goes down coming over here to the exhaust side so I just want to mention that notice the carburetor and the exhaust both share the same space I never thought that that was a really smart idea because what happens if a leak gas and it hits the exhaust manifold it's going to erupt probably catch on fire but they did it like that for years. I don't know if that ever became a problem. In the comment section below, was that ever an issue? Oh yeah, the hood, the hood on this is pretty heavy too. On to the pros and cons, but before we do, I've been asked a lot as of recently, which cars would I like to see follow me home? And I'll go more in depth with this at the end of the year episode, end of the year reflection episode, but this one, I am a huge Packard fan and I often joke with my wife and I tell her, if we ever make it in this life, I'm not getting some cookie cutter brand new Rolls Royce or Bentley that everybody and their mom has. Psst. We're getting a twin six baby or a super eight. Having looked at some 12s, not to buy, but in passing, they are over the top, huge, and expensive. We're talking of half a million dollars plus for a car that um, you can't really drive every day. But this car, you can have that Packard look without the high running cost. Somebody told me that it's like $1,500 just to tune up a 12. Anyway, absolutely love the Packard 6. Great color, awesome interior, Rolling art for the common man. If I owned this Packard 6, I would drive it every day. All right, let's talk pros and cons. So I generally get all the pros and cons from the complete book of collectible cars, but this car isn't in there. So these pros and cons are based on my general observations. On the positive side, still affordable and has that look of a more upscale car without breaking the bank. This car has presence without being over the top. It's a pre-war Packard and has a huge trunk. On the cons, for a business coupe, it's pretty big car for two people. Some highbrow Packard collectors look down upon the 115 and sort of the 120 series. All right, now it's time for Name That Tune. First person to give me the correct name of the band as well as song title, both correctly, and the first one to do so will have their comment pinned to the top of the comment section. Okay, so I'm gonna be a little bit lenient on that one because you could either give me the band or artist because there was a group as well as a single singer. Thank you all so much for coming out and watching this. I appreciate all of the support. If you'd like to get in touch with me, shoot me a comment in the comment section below. I read and answer all comments posted or check out our Facebook group that correlates with this YouTube channel. There's no obligation to join, but it gives you the opportunity to share your rides, stories, experiences. If you're interested, the link will be in the description. So if I catch you on here, or there, just know I appreciate everything. And until next time, toodaloo!